Now available at patristicnectar.org. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present Walk in Love, an exposition of First, Second, and Third John. St. John the Theologian is at one and the same time the Church's most profound theologian and her most simple and loving pastor. St. John's Gospel soars to the heights in revealing profound Trinitarian theology. St. John's Apocalypse pulls back the curtain on eschatological mysteries, and the epistles of St. John reveal the Holy Apostle's burning heart of love for the flock and his solid and practical counsel to believers on how to live for the Lord. These letters move between the dual affirmations of divinity that God is light and God is love, and call upon the people of God to embrace holiness and love as the distinguishing marks of Christian believers. Lecture titles include 1 John chapter 1, God is Light, 1 John chapter 2, Love, Obedience, and the Antichrist, 1 John chapter 3, Children of God, 1 John chapter 4, Testing the Spirits, 1 John chapter 5, Christian Victory, 2nd and 3rd John, Walking in Love. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org. And now, The Arena with Father Josiah Trenum. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, brothers and sisters, you've seen two successively amazing gospel texts where our Lord in both cases, this week and last Sunday, asks his disciples to do what appears to be absolutely impossible. Last week, he told his disciples, you give them something to eat. <laughs> Feed these thousands and thousands of people from the little puny resources that you have. And we see that the fruit of obedience to Christ, the fruit of trusting his word is the miraculous, the deification of mankind. Today, our Lord looks at Peter in a very tense scenario. The disciples are exhausted. They're on a ship that's being battered by the waves. I don't know how many of you have been on boats that you think you thought were going to sink. Very scary, exceedingly scary. Some of us have been on boats that had bullets coming at us. But the disciples were exhausted. They were wasted by the winds. They thought that they might drown. And then they saw the Lord on the water. If that wasn't enough, he looked at Peter and he said, come. <laughs> what would you have said or done? There's a beautiful depiction of this in the St. Andrew Shrine with St. Andrew sitting on the, in the boat He's the one that has the halo, and he's watching his brother sink. But he didn't sink until he doubted. By faith, he was glorified. By trust in Christ, he became what Christ is. By belief and adherence to him, by reliance upon him, the works that he does in his own words, we will also do and greater works than these. And so Peter walked on the water just like Christ, just like the master. Can you imagine two better gospel texts to surround the feast this last week of the transfiguration? The feast that proclaims to us that the goal and destiny of Christians is to be united to Jesus and to become what he is. By nature, we will become by grace. To have these two incredible gospel texts showing what human beings can do when united to Christ, what they will be, what marvelous days. Our future is not uh, the future we seek. The kingdom of God is not just American life without the coronavirus. <laughs> the future we seek is unspeakable glory, 
that day when we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our, my Father. That's what Jesus said. That's our future. When we will see him as he is, St. John says, I don't know what we shall be then, but I know this, that when he appears in his glory, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. This is our future. Today is a marvelous day in the church. My enthusiasm is high because of the significance of this day, and don't we need it in this time of uh, so much tension? Christian leaders across the state being threatened by Marxist thugs, public health officers threatening priests with $1,000 a week fines or arrest in LA County, in Ventura County, and other places. These are bizarre days, absolutely bizarre days. So today is a great offset of the sorrows of this falling world. Today happens to be, brothers and sisters, the 50th anniversary of the glorification of St. Herman of Alaska, the wonder worker of America. On this very day, the 9th of August in 1970, St. Herman was glorified as a saint. He stands as the witness for us, the gift from Christ to us, because that's what saints are. He stands as the witness of what we will be. He is our model of a glorified man. He broke every norm of human existence. His life in the eyes of the world is impossible. But it happened. <laughs> and it's the root of uh, the proof of the gospel in our own nation. This is why Orthodox of every stripe, no matter where we're from, we celebrate St. Herman, not just in America, but St. Herman is celebrated all over the world. I reviewed this morning a number of sermons that were delivered by the recently departed and deeply respected and much revered former abbot of the Holy Monastery of Simeno, Petra, Father Emilianos. Father Emilianos delivered a number of sermons honoring the glorification of St. Herman of Alaska and received a, a, a large relic, a large bone, I believe a thigh bone of St. Herman into Greece. And in the sermon that Father Emilianos gave about, about the significance of St. Herman, he said, look, the, the gospel, the way of life fashioned in human beings by the gospel, which took root in the Middle East, and then by St. Paul's missionary labors and the apostles went to the edge of the empire and even east and to North Africa. It then, it settled in a special way on, in Mount Athos. And that hesychastic life, that life of perpetual prayer moved to Russia and it filled Russia and Russia it gave the gift of St. Herman and brought St. Herman to America who brought the same way of life the same life seeking the kingdom of God above all things. And then Father Emiliano said, we've come full circle and now St. Herman has returned to Greece. What a day. St. Herman is a witness for us and I want to mention a few things that I, I especially want you to remember about him. St. Herman is someone we should all know. All American Orthodox Christians should cherish him. He is a model of consecrated youth. Do you know that he became a monk at 16 years of age? 16. He shows us what, it, what is possible for young people. It didn't look like he was going to have a very long life. He had only been a monk a short time and he developed a terrible abscess just under his chin in his throat here and it was brutal. Most people consigned him to death. He refused to go see a physician, and he just waited for death, and he prayed to the mother of God, whom he loved, and he took a cloth, and he laid a cloth upon the icon of the mother of God, and he prayed for healing. He went to sleep, and he had a vision of the mother of God. He dreamed of her, and he took the cloth that had been on her icon, and he placed it on his throat, 
and he was miraculously healed by the mother of God. The only thing she left him was a little tiny mark, no pain, no hindrance, just a little tiny mark so he would always remember that he would always give thanks to her. You know probably the famous miracle that he did it later in his life with her icon. He was always affixed to the mother of God and what a beautiful thing to hear in the middle of the Dormition fast. Are you affixed to the mother of God, brothers and sisters? Are you affixed to her? This is how St. Herman lived. He was a man who had a profound spiritual patrimony that he respected. When he became a monk and he went to Valam Monastery in the north of Russia, exceedingly cold, he was a spiritual son of an incredible elder named Nazarius, Elder Nazarius. Elder Nazarius happened to be the spiritual father of Saint Seraphim of Sarov as well. Tells you something about who Elder Nazarius is. Saint Herman had Elder Nazarius as a spiritual father as a young monk, as a young man. And when Saint Herman came to America and spent almost 40 years here, he never ceased corresponding with the elder until the elder reposed, and then he continued his correspondence with the elder's successor abbot. He never lost his connection with his roots. He nourished his spiritual patrimony and built upon it, and that is a beautiful example for us if we hope to be something spiritually. To build upon what we've been given, not to spoil our inheritance, not to take something that we've been given and not live up to it. Take it and build on it and never stop giving thanks for the good things that you've been given. Do you know what he named Spruce Island in Alaska? New Valam. That's what he called his, his monastery. He said it was his diocese of several hundred because several hundred natives lived on the island with him. He was a man who cherished his own spiritual patrimony. He was also burning with an evangelical spirit. When he was a young monk, an incredible bishop named Gabriel came to the monastery and asked the abbot to give him 10 monks, basically to commit themselves to the most dangerous of journeys. 10 monks who would go with him, with a team that the bishop would organize. They would cross over Russia, completely through the wilds of Siberia, to the Kamchatka Islands, and then into the Aleutian island chain that had only been discovered a few years before and had only come into Russia and the Russian imperial possession for a few short years. Ten monks volunteered, including St. Herman. I highly doubt that St. Herman went to Valam Monastery in order to become a missionary to America. He was so zealous that he couldn't hold back. The thought of being able to bring the gospel to thousands and thousands of natives who had never heard anything about Jesus was just too much for him. The idea of doing good to that many people, of helping that many people find their faith, it overwhelmed him. So he volunteered and, and he left. It makes me think of that great line in The Lord of the Rings, spoken by Gimli, when they were about to go into Mordor, and he said, little chance of success, certainty of death, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? This is exactly what St. Herman, uh, how St. Herman responded to this call. And they had wild success, wild success. There was one archimandry, three hieromonks, two hierodeacons, and, some, and then monks. They baptized 7,000 people their first year. They did 1,500 marriages. They started schools, and then the trial started. Our commander, Joseph, who was called back to uh, Russia in order to be consecrated a bishop for the mission. He was consecrated, he was put on a boat with some of the priests, and they drowned, and the boat sank, and no one was ever found on the way back to Alaska. Father Juvenali at the same time was pushing up to reach unreached people groups in Alaska and ended up being martyred. And even after he was shot to death with arrows, he stood up and followed. He was so thirsty to receive them. 
He followed them to evangelize them even when they're dead. He scared them to death. Father Juvenali. Soon it was only St. Herman left. And so he settled and built a little tiny hut for himself on Spruce Island. He built a little hut and a little chapel. Just him. Just him. He hoed some land that was considered to be too difficult to grow anything in, and he ended up growing cabbages and vegetables. He used seaweed for fertilizer. No one was able to grow anything there, none of the natives, before he did it, and after he died, no, none of his successors, none of the monks who followed him were ever able to get anything to grow. Apparently, his deified life, his face with the glory of God was more capable of photosynthesis than the sun. <laughs> you know, now, very near there, we have, many of you know, uh, the wonderful monk Papa Ephraim, who for many, many years was at St. Anthony's in, uh, in Arizona but who has now, uh, with the blessing of the late Elder Ephraim, moved to Alaska just to a little island right next to St. Herman's, to St. Neilis Island there. I had some nice uh, email interaction with him of late. He built his garden, he fed himself and the natives. He lived incredibly thirsty life for God. That's another way of saying he was a great ascetic. Great ascetics are simply people whose thirst to be near God is so extreme. He wore the same clothes in summer and winter, which was simply one cassock that he had for years and years that he kept patching, over which was a deerskin smock. He wore the same pair of boots, his cloak, 16 pounds of chains underneath his cassock that no one knew he ever wore until he died. If you go to, to Kodiak today and you go to St. Herman's Church, there on his coffin are his chains and his cloak. He slept on the floor with two bricks for a pillow, but he put a shirt over them so that people wouldn't know they were bricks and would think it was a pillow. His blanket was a wooden board that he kept on the stove. So it would be on the stove, and then he would just put it on top of himself while he slept. When he died, he asked that that be his pall, that, that he be covered in his, he wanted to, be, to, to die and be covered with his board. He was once asked by a visitor, how is it that you could live here for all of these years alone? And he was completely shocked. He said, what are you talking about, alone? I live with God, and I live with the angels. And who would you rather talk to, God and his angels or men? That was his response. The, the thought that he was alone was completely beso- beside himself. He had his precious possession in his little hut was the newly translated from the Greek into, into Slavic, philokolia. This is what he had with him. He chanted the services morning, noon, and night. He turned his little hut into a schoolhouse where he taught children and adults. He taught them the law of God, church music, how to chant the hours. He read the epistle and a gospel to them constantly and preached sermons to them. He was a mighty defender of the natives against all the Russian merchants, shaming the merchants for their brutality and constantly putting himself between the natives and the merchants. He reconciled couples. He made cookies and biscuits for which he was famous for all the kids. This is how St. Herman lived. His valor was especially obvious among epidemics. An American ship, for instance, came into Sitka and brought with it a a horrible plague that went up Alaska and came all the way to Kodiak and to Spruce. For one month, it absolutely decimated the population, killed something like half of them. And St. Herman sat there holding people in his arms. He would confess them and nurse them and help them to die. He's famous for evangelizing sea captains who would come into Kodiak to bring their ships, and they had heard about him, so they would summon, they would send a little skiff to Spruce, and they would say, Captain so-and-so from Germany is here, or Captain so-and-so from so, such a place would come. And we have the written accounts of a number of these sea captains who were brought to faith in Christ, some from atheism, some from Lutheranism to Holy Orthodoxy, all by St. Herman's witness. It was in fact in one of those companies with about 25 officers 
that he gave his most famous sermon on the love of God. That incredible sermon when he asked all of the men there to tell him the one thing that would make them happiness, happiest in all of life. And some said it would be to have a fine wife or to have a fine ship to captain, on and on they went. And he's, he brought them all to recognize that if you love all of the gifts of God, wouldn't it be most appropriate to love the giver of the gifts himself above everything else? And he got them all to agree. <laughs> and he said those famous words, let us then, brothers, from this day, from this hour, from this minute, choose to love God above everything else. He fed bears by his hands. When a tsunami was threatening Spruce Island and was on its way, he calmly waited on the beach and took his icon of the mother of God and placed it in the sand and told his spiritual daughter, Sophia, he said, don't worry, it will never go past there. And he quietly went back to his hut. The tsunami crashed on the, on the island and stopped right at his icon. He left, when he reposed, he left that icon with her. And she said, Sophia, if you ever have trouble, use my icon, you know how to use it. <laughs> he saw angels bless the waters because he wasn't a priest and couldn't do the agiasmo, the angels came and did it for him and he would gather the waters from the bay and serve everyone the holy water. When it came time for his repose, he prophesied the details of his death and he said these beautiful words. Whatever you do, do not honor me at all. I want to be always the least in the universe. I want to be always the least in the universe. He asked that he be buried immediately and that the natives not allow any time to pass for any dignitaries to come. He said, don't wait for a priest, it's not gonna be possible. Don't wait for the governor, the Russian governor to come. Bury me immediately. They tried, but the governor sent a message that they were forbidden to bury him until he arrived. And there was a storm for one month. They couldn't make the short, little tiny one to two mile passage between Kodiak and Spruce. For one month, St. Herman's body was left exposed. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Finally, the natives, after seeing him there incorrupt for a month, decided, you know what, I think we'll obey him and just bury him, which they did. When he died, elders in a neighboring island saw a pillar of light he radiated his whole life and even in death, the movement of his soul was a glorious one. Five years later, the great Saint Innocent, enlightener of North America, was coming into Kodiak and his boat was near capsizing. And he had heard about Saint Herman and he turned himself from his boat. Five years Saint Herman's been in the grave and he reached his hands out and he said, Holy Father Herman, if you have found boldness with God, help us now. He said within 15 minutes, the ocean was as calm as a lake, completely calm. Brothers and sisters, this is our Father Herman. He's calling us all to believe in the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ, to thirst for God, to choose to love God above everything else, and to have confidence, to have confidence. This fallen world, this is not our destiny, this is not our end. Our end, brothers and sisters, is transfiguration in Christ. It's to have radiant faces and an unbreakable spirit and unceasing joy and happiness like St. Herman and with St. Herman in the presence of Christ our Lord, to whom be glory and honor with his Father and the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. We hope that you have enjoyed and have been edified by this presentation offered to you by Patristic Nectar Publications, a nonprofit organization committed to nourishing the spiritually thirsty with the sweet teachings of the Holy Fathers. If you are interested in other available titles, or if you would like more information on Patristic Nectar publications, please visit our website at www.patristicnectar.org. Again, that's www.patristicnectar.org.